So today's event, uh, we're going to be exploring what it means to be queer Asian in terms of how the queer community is perceived in various Asian contexts, how these perceptions are formed and upheld and what can be done to improve the perceptions, experiences and rights of queer Asians throughout the world. Now, as I said, we're lucky, uh, very lucky to be joined by a panel of expert activists uh, from all over the globe, actually. We've got uh, the almost the full range of time zones with us today um, to uh, help us to talk through um, the various perspectives representing various Asian regions and the diaspora. Before I introduce them, uh, I wanted to raise the issue of the use of the word queer to, ref to refer to the LGBT plus community uh, in this context. And uh, the, we've arrived at uh, the use of this sometimes contentious term in consultation with the panel, and the panelists have produced uh, this statement. We adopt the term queer because the various conventional acronyms for sexual minorities proved challenging in the Asian context. While we recognize the pejorative origin of the term, today we reclaim and repurpose it as an act of empowerment as an umbrella term that encompasses various sexual orientations and gender identities. Throughout the discussion, we might use certain terms in an interchangeable fashion. For example, gay doesn't necessarily mean only gay males. Likewise, for ease of discussion, LGBT includes other variations such as LGBT+, LGBTQ+, and LGBTI. There is zero intention of any disrespect to anyone. So it's a real delight to, to welcome our panel of speakers. Uh, as we have a relatively short period to cover such a broad topic, on this occasion, we're going to forego the usual formalities of providing a full biography for each speaker. So I'll just give a, a, a very brief introduction. And instead, we'll post a link in the chat to the event page where you can find the full speaker biographies and read them at your leisure. So without further ado, um, delighted to welcome and introduce you to Jerome Yao of Pink Alliance, Hong Kong. Uh, Pink Alliance, and you can see behind Jerome the fantastic views of Hong Kong there. Pink Alliance is a non-profit LGBT plus organization whose mission is to advance dignity, acceptance, and equal rights for people of different sexual orientations and gender identities in Hong Kong through community engagement and public education. And it's quite late in the evening uh, in Hong Kong and Korea and for various of our panelists. So a, a real thanks to those of you who are going late into your evenings to be with us. Uh, on, the other, on the other side of the day, first, first meeting of the day, uh, we're really pleased to welcome Glenn D. Magpante Esquire, who is a long-term civil rights attorney, professor and LGBTQ rights activist from, from the USA. Uh, and Glenn, I think you're speaking to us from New York. Is that right? Great, I see a nod. So welcome. Great, great to have you on the event. Yang Yi is a human rights advocate and LGBT uh, campaigner who works in LGBT rights advocacy and China Radio Media Awards. In the past 12 years, he's been working in areas such as conservation, LGBT rights and media freedom in China. Yang, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to, to join us. It's great to have you with us. Midnight Punkaset Watana is the executive director of the APCOM Foundation. Great to see you, Midnight. Thank you for joining us, which works to improve the health and rights of gay men, other men who have sex with men, and other sexual orientation, uh, gender identity and expression, and sex characteristics people uh, uh, across Asia and the Pacific. So again, midnight, thank you for joining us. Uh, somebody in, uh, uh, in a more local time zone uh, joining us from the UK is Kakan uh, Qureshi. Kakan is the founder of Finding a Voice, a voluntary-led organization for South Asians, LGBT+, aged 18 and over, of any faith, culture, religion, or disability in the UK. So again, Kakan, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to be part of our panel today. Uh, and uh, last, but as they say, certainly not least, 
Minhee Ryu is an attorney at law and member of uh, Gagunet, the Korean network for partnership and marriage rights uh, of LGBT um, individuals. She was one of the six co-founders of the Korean Lawyers for Public Interest and Human Rights, uh, hopeandlaw.org uh, in Korea. And I, I think, I think Minhee may have the you may be the latest, so it's uh, something like 10.30 in the evening, I think, your time, or 9.30, so I got that about right. So uh, again, huge thanks to everyone for, for joining us. Uh, what I'm going to do is invite each of our panellists to give a brief three-minute overview. That's the challenge that we've set them. Just three minutes to give an overview of the state of play um, about perceptions of the A Asian LGBT community and rights in each of their, their regions. And then we'll have a panel discussion. Then Glenn is going to share a short video uh, with us. And that will give you in the audience time to ask uh, all sorts of questions. And we'll have about 20, 20 minutes uh, at the end of the event where I'll be able to put your questions um, to the panel. So that's, uh, that's the idea. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand over to Jerome uh, to give us uh, your view of the state of play, perceptions of Asian, the Asian LGBT community in Hong Kong. Jerome, over to you. Thanks, Robin, for the very kind introduction. And uh, I guess hello to everyone online. So uh, when it comes to LGBT equality in Hong Kong, I, I would say, within the APAC region, it's definitely not the best, but definitely also not the worst. I would say middle of the pack. So to begin with, homosexuality is perfectly legal in this city. Uh, we uh, decriminalized homosexuality um, pretty much about 30 years ago. Uh, however, when it comes to legal protection is rather limited. Although on one hand, we do have a bill of rights, but uh, its application is really limited to government and public bodies. So it does not apply applicable to private companies and whatnot. Um, and even so, obviously we do not have an anti-discrimination law. Uh, when it comes to transgender rights, uh, again, we are rather lagging behind when it comes to gender recognition. We don't really have a gender recognition law per se, uh, although for transgender people, they can change their uh, gender, but they would have to undergo sex uh, reassignment surgery, which we consider to be totally uh, an out-of-date practice. We have been uh, fighting and asking the government to change it. Uh, the government a few years ago launched a consultation. They came up with a report uh, that they promised would release its final report, but it has been, I would say, at least three years, and we are still waiting for that. And on marriage equality, unfortunately, uh, we, uh, this city does not recognize uh, same-sex marriage, although interestingly, because of various court cases, um, uh, there are limitations, I mean, I would say, yes, there are certain uh, recognitions, very limited uh, of uh, same-sex relationships, for example, for immigration rights, uh, for uh, civil servants, special benefits, and joint income tax assessment. And last year, we won two very important cases. One concerns uh, applying uh, as, as a spouse, as, as spouses, as a household unit for public rental housing. The other concerns about uh, inheritance and intestacy. So in both cases, uh, the applicants won, uh, but the government uh, has already indicated that they will file an appeal. So we expect these two cases will go all the way to the court of final appeal, which is the top court in Hong Kong. At the same time, we lost uh, also two very important cases concerning uh, legal recognition of uh, same-sex relationships, which maybe I go into details uh, at a later time. But suffice to say, uh, here the LGBT community here is working very hard uh, on one hand to fight for an anti-discrimination law, which we have been fighting for 20 odd years. Uh, on marriage equality, we are working very hard on that one. And I would say, uh, legally speaking, we are taking, uh, I would say, a sal salami slicing approach. We tackle all these uh, different issues one by one, and hopefully when it comes to the, at a certain point where it's so difficult for the court to really continue uh, and say, look, you have to go one right after another, and hopefully one day the court would take a bolder step and then say, look, this is just plain wrong, and the government has to recognize uh, same-sex relationships. But that would take a few years' time at the very least, and we are working hard on that. And last, I guess my last comment about the LGBT community in, in Hong Kong is, it's very international. 
simply because you know Hong Kong is a rather international city. Uh, uh, although the majority of the population is of Chinese ethnicity, but you, we have people, you know, born overseas, live overseas, they come back. Of course, we have a pretty uh, significant expatriate population. So the, the community here is very, very international. And that also would, uh, I would say, inject a lot of uh, interesting uh, dynamism at the same time challenges when we come to uh, advancing LGBT equality. And definitely when the question comes up about this question is about being uh, queer Asian. I mean, how we uh, people in the LGBT community in Hong Kong, uh, I would say, uh, uh, let's just say, uh, of have different views on how we would better advance uh, LGBT equality in the city. So look forward to uh, further uh, dis uh, to discussing this very, very uh, interesting topic. So I think uh, that's pretty much all uh, from you at this stage. Jerome, thank you. Um, thank you for two things. That was a, a fantastic overview. You covered uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of ground within the three minutes. So you've uh, you've set the bar for the other panelists. So thank thank you, Jerome. That that's uh, that's really good, and uh, plenty of things to discuss later. Glenn, if I may um, if I may turn to you next, please. So uh, your your views and perspectives. Of course. Uh, so good morning from New York. Good evening from the other side of the world. Um, my name is Glenn Mukbantai, and. Uh, I most recently served as the executive director and counsel to INCAPIA, the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance. It's a national uh, US-based federation of LGBTQ, Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, and Pacific Islanders. Most of the work that we had done, that I have done for the past decade, has largely been on building the capacity and leadership of a new generation of activists in the United States who are Asian American to show that the gay community is not all white, that the Asian American community is not all straight, and yet some of, and some of us are brave and proud. Uh, we have done advocacy on same-sex marriage, non-discrimination, um, uh, immigrants' rights, uh, and finally, visibility, bringing our no stories and narratives to, to the fore. Because so many times, the images and the faces of our community, of the Asian American community in pop culture, uh, does not represent all of our identities or any of our identities. Um, and when they do, they are particular Asian ethnicities that are seen and others are overlooked. There are body types uh, that are seen and overlooked and that plays into structural racism. And the most recent um, work is also understanding our relationship as Asian Americans, a racial minority in America in the context of Black Lives Matter where there is, though we face discrimination as Asians and a racial minority, there are others whose discrimination has been more long-term and more sinister. Uh, uh, so, gong uh, hai happy Lunar New Year to all of you. It's coming up and it's time to be together. And in America, where we have advanced tremendously the cause of LGBT equality, we can get married. It's fantastic. But I have said many times, but who will come to the wedding if our parents and in our parents, if our parents and families do not accept us? We can get married, but we could be deported, or we could get married and we can still lose our health care. Uh, refuge of refuge from Trump. Uh, so, I'm so sorry about it. I'm so embarrassed of my, my former president, but it's a new day. Um, the work that we are doing is not only about legal equality, that is important and we deserve protections, but it's cultural change. It's changing the circumstances so that people know being queer is not a white Western disease. And remember for, America, Asians are an immigrant community. My mother, I love her, but she makes me crazy. Uh, and I, but I love her, remembers the gay community in 1965. Parents, when trans kids come out, their parents actually know transgender people from Asia. You wanna be a prostitute? 
No, ma, no, never. Why do you, you say that? Because that's what our parents see as Asians, as transgender Asians. And so it is a change that we must do in our families, in our communities to humanize the Asian American experience that we are doing here. And not to be the American who exports democracy. I do think that on some level that if we can make good change here, that'll go on everywhere else. Uh, but I wanna hear the other panelists and learn from all of you uh, about your work. Glenn, that's great. Thank, thank you very much. And in, interesting, interesting what you say about, you know, you may have the right to marry, but if your family doesn't, doesn't, doesn't come, what, what does that mean? So, uh, Really interesting. Um, bef just before we move to uh, our, our next panelist, thanks again, Glenn. Um, just to remind you, if you if you have a, a question, please do post it in the in the Q and A, and then we can cap capture it all. So, thanks that uh, people are already asking questions. But if you could do it through the Q and A, it'll make my life easier because then I've only got one box that I need to check rather than uh, the Q and A and the chat. So, um, Yang. Would you be happy to go next and give us your thoughts and views of uh, how the LGBT community is perceived in, in your region? Yeah, for sure. Hello, um, my name is Yang Yi. I come from LGBT rights advocacy. We're the first LGBT organizations in China that especially focus on law and the policy. In the past eight years, we have launched 12 impact litigations that have covered issues like conversion therapy and discrimination in workplace and marriage equality. So uh, I think in China, being, uh, out, being LGBT people is not a crime or it's not all a disease anymore, but we're still facing a lot of challenges and difficulties. So for us, the most, the, the biggest challenge is in China, we don't have any legal protections. There's no any law or any policy that protect LGBTQ plus people here. So I can give you some examples. So the first, um, based on a study from Rainbow Law School in China, they found that in China, we have a huge, we have thousands of mountains laws and yes, but we found that the uh, 12,000 law terms in China that contain some message like spouse, husband, wife, families, relatives. But if we, so for, for gay people, if you don't have a marriage, you don't have same-sex marriage, you, your rights are not guaranteed. You, you will be excluded from the law system. It's the very side things. Another thing in China is because we don't have any anti-discrimination laws, sometimes, 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 when you'll be discriminated against by your maybe your employers or someone, maybe your professors in uh, campus, you don't have any reason like bring the, your case to the court. So, for instance, uh, in 2017, uh, a college student found that in her uh, psychology textbook it described homosexuality still like a disease. So she wanted to sue to the publisher and also his community, his uh, college. But because we don't have laws you, that we can use it. So, it's, so at the beginning, it's very, very challenging. So eventually when we, find, we figured out some justification like because in China, homosexuality is not this anymore. So if any textbook contains this kind of uh, information, it's, uh, it's like a product that the quality of the product is not very good. So we use the commercial law and this reason brought uh, the case to the court and defended the court takes course. But unfortunately, we lost the first stage. Uh, we lost the first stage and we still looking for the next step. So for these 12 impact litigations, we won six of them and we lost uh, three cases and, and, and three cases are still ongoing. So um, we're looking, so yeah, we're still looking for the result. So this is what I'm going to say here. And if you want to know more about as uh, our living conditions in China, please directly contact me or ask me in the next part. 
So I'm going to, so I think I saved a lot of time here. Thank you very much. That, that, that's very clever to, to try to use commercial law to, as, a, a, as, a, as a way to, um, uh, to make the point. So I, I do hope that you're successful uh, with, with that line of argument. Very, very, very clever. Um, Yang, thank you ever so much. Um, Midnight, would you uh, be willing to go next and give us your, your thoughts and views? Thanks. Sawadee kap everyone. Um, good evening from Bangkok. And of course, you know, Thailand is seen as a very much a paradise for LGBTI people, right? But like in the same as um, um, you know, Yang Yi, what he said in terms of the protection um, of LGBT is really not there at all. Culturally, we're very open. Um, what you do in your bedroom, people don't really care about um, as long as it doesn't kind of offend them in public. So that's the kind of like the society that in Thailand we live in. But in terms of the laws and policies, you know, transgender people cannot have their um, gender recognized, intersex people, nope, they, they, they don't have a choice. Um, and, um, and of course, in terms of um, how that get, plays out, in your lives in terms of getting social protection from the government. And this is, you know, for everyone going through COVID-19 time, we have done research in Thailand where we know that LGBTI people have been very much at the most vulnerable and not able to access these social protections because they are not recognized. So they work in um, the informal sector, in tourism industry, um, sex workers, uh, for example, and, um, you know, very, um, not um, stable jobs. So they're the first to be let go. So right now we're in the second wave in Thailand, um, no jobs, um, tourists are not coming in. So what happens? It's really the community that comes together to then support each other. So this is really important to ensure that we have the resources to be able to be resilient, to also be able to provide a voice and to do advocacy around issues that um, you know other people might not take part in or might not see to take care of um, LGBTI people. So we form a, a small groups that kind of like do the advocacy to governments and also to donors around funding to the region, particularly when we know that um, in Asia Pacific region, funders is not really coming to provide us with you know, support, particularly for countries that has you know, high levels of income already. So LGBTI people are really being left behind. I'm staying into um, uh, two tiers because APCOM works at a regional level across 35 countries into uh, working between the communities organizations. And at the regional level, 15 countries still criminalize homosexuality. And I see that as a question about, you know, so what, what happens in certain countries where, where criminalizations do exist. Um, and, but, in, but within Thailand, where, where we are based, uh, we have um, many people who are from other countries as well, um, working in, in this, in this uh, area. It's so important that um, you know, there is a voice and it's so important that there is movement around um, economic inclusion of LGBTI people. So one of our projects that we're doing is looking at how do we have more inclusive dialogues in the employment sector around bringing out the uh, visibility and also the talents and be recognized that LGBTI people can also be, um, you know, not, just, not just working in certain industries, but can also um, be leaders in um, certain sectors and they can choose what they want to do as well. So I think the, um, for, for the state of play with Thailand, in terms of the talent that's already there, who are recognized it because we're um, seen as more open, how do they get the, um, the states or those who are the policymakers to recognize and also give rights that is affordable to everybody as a citizen? And then at the regional level, so what are the um, issues that uh, we can you know, to have these discussions together to push for certain uh, rights and certain um, policies with um, international bodies um, at the UN, um, with multinational um, companies. And I think with also kind of like globally uh, for the support for our communities who are here actually tonight, um, because we are all struggling with, um, with funding resources and we need to kind of have resources to be able to do what we do. Um, they are, we, including myself, already give out a lot of our time and also uh, a lot of our efforts into um, you know, doing this kind of advocacy. And um, if one of us goes, then I think it really sets the, um, the movement behind. So what we need is actually having that kind of like the space to be able to collate, um, to be able to uh, mobilize at the regional level to make us much a stronger voice for the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. Midnight, thank you. And, and um, 
those of you who put so much time and effort and energy into activism and that advocacy you're doing a, a a huge service for for the whole community so we we do we do thank you but appreciate the you know the the resource constraint that you that you have to have to face um midnight and it'd also be great to come back and hear not just more about thailand but also the regional work that you do so i'm sure we'll be picking that up in the in the panel discussion um if we can turn next to uh kakan um and uh, uh, to get your view, particularly, I guess, of the South Asian uh, LGBT community in the, in the UK, but uh, more, more broadly, your views and perspective. Over to you, Kaka. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, first of all, I just want to say, you know, I applaud the same sex legislation that we have here in the UK and the Equality Act, because it enables people like myself to marry, adopt foster children as well, and share the same rights as uh, our heterosexual counterparts. But what I've noted as well over the last few years um, is that the same-sex legislation isn't, transfer isn't transferring very well to the South Asian community. And in particular, this was highlighted a couple of years ago when I became sort of uh, engrossed in the L what they call the LGBT school row, whereby um, a school wanted to advocate um, about uh, homosexuality and other forms of families, whereas the local community at that time um, they were very much against it, said it was against their religion. Now, this is something that I tried to advocate over the last few years, that I've noted that um, within the South Asian community here in the UK, um, a lot of people are entrenched in tradition, culture and religion, which is really unfortunate um, because the disparity is becoming more and more apparent now. And it gets to the point where, you know, they, they ask the question of, um, are you gay? Are you not gay enough? You're Asian, you're not Asian enough, or you're Muslim, or you're not Muslim enough. Um, and you know, when somebody like me comes across, you know, who appears to be um, very open, very proud of who I am, um, they think that I'm entrenched in Western ideology and the concepts of homosexuality is still unfortunately seen as um, a Western concept. Whereas I try to challenge and advocate the fact that, you know, homosexuality has been here since the millennia and it's written um, in all the scriptures and all the art books that we've read, you know, in history as well. And that we've contributed a great deal to society. But it's unfortunate that there are some people who still carry a lot of prejudices and discrimination. Um, and what I find is that asylum seekers and refugees who are coming across from um, Asian continent, in particular India and Pakistan, um, they feel that although they can be open and be more accepted here in the community, um, I find that the diaspora is so close-knit and tight that they still carry this sort of um, burden because they don't want to come out in the community um, because they feel that somebody in that community might recognize them and might tell them I'm going to stay back in Pakistan or India. Um, and that's how it plays on their, their mindset, you see, and it impacts on their mental health. And no matter how much I try to encourage people and advocate on their behalf to say, it's okay just to be who you are, um, it's the, the impact of this on their mental health that bothers me most. You know, how do we overcome those particular barriers? How do we help people to move forward? Um, I've also found that um, lesbian, South Asian lesbians in particular as well, are very much hidden within, within our community. You know, every space that I've entered, even now, for example, um, we, we don't see many South Asian lesbians speaking up. There are quite a few in the UK and in particular in London. But overall, we're not gaining that representation of lesbians in the community or, or for that matter, trans individuals. Um, and I noticed that some intersex South Asians are popping their heads now above the parapet and that's helping. But again, it's about how do we shake it up? How do we sort of show representation within the media, within um, queer spaces, within the books that we're reading or for that matter in schools or academic institutions? Um, and that I, I find quite troublesome now because here we are in 2021 now and you know things although they seem to um hit a great deal a couple of years ago um everybody seems to have either recoiled or they've gone back into the closet um and it's a shame as well because the last couple of years ago um i thought we really had a gaijin revolution going on because there's a number of people who are approaching me and they seem to be quite happy and very much out in the community um you know saying that i, I identify as queer and muslim or or gay and sikh or hindu and lesbian um, and I just thought this is really good and it's really groundbreaking. We're making some headway now, but it's unfortunate um, that in the last year and a half that things have quietened down again um, and people aren't reaching out as much as they used to. I don't know if that's because of the COVID pandemic <laughs> or because the situation has been that because of the school row, which occurred a couple of years ago, um, it made people much more fearful. So we're constantly in this kind of flux 
of things moving round and round. You know, when you think you're making headway, we're taking two steps back. And even though I, I offer support and say we have same-sex legislation here in the country and we have a lot of democracies and freedoms to express oneself, um, people can't shake off the burdens and the sh- of, of the past, you see. Um, and it's like, how do I break that down and how do I take it forward to the next generation? Um, you know, and it's the next generation that can either make or break us as individuals and especially as a queer community as well. You know, we've got to find a way to have the heterosexual community be much more accepting of who we are you know and it's and it's quite upsetting sometimes and distressing when you hear about people still being abused for representing themselves or just wanting the freedoms like everybody else in the UK I can't thank thank you very much and I, I that's that's a theme um that we're going to return to in the in the panel discussion just to give everybody a heads up so they compose a, a few thoughts there's the you know uh, what are the formal laws in the country and then what what are the set of values and conventions in uh, in your particular community which um, uh, uh, may present challenges even if they're you know e- even if there are laws in place so Kakan thank thank you ever so much for for that insight particularly into the uh, um, the, the issues for South, South Asians. Um, and Min He, if I can um, turn to you next. Again, just to remind everybody, um, please do remember, if you've got a question, uh, do it through the Q&A. Um, I, I, I'm really poor at multitasking, so I can only really look at one thing at one time. So if you've got a fantastic question, make sure it's in the Q&A, and then I, then I can see it when the time comes. Uh, but please keep them coming. And there are already some really good questions in there. So thank you. Minhi, could I turn over to you now for your your views from Korea? Sure. Uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, hello to everyone who's joining us today. My name is Minhi Liu. I'm based in Seoul, South Korea, and I'm, I'm happy to join this great panel today. So how is South Korea doing on LGBTQ rights? Um, in terms of legal framework, uh, although we didn't have any criminalization of same-sex activity of civilians, we do have anti-gay sodomy law in the Military Criminal Act, which is a legacy of UK and US articles of war. Uh, The constitutional review is still pending. We hope to win the case this year. Also, we uh, do not have any anti-discrimination law based on sexual orientation and gender identity. The legislative debate has been going on in our parliament for the last 14 years, but it hasn't been passed uh, at the moment. Also, same-sex couples don't have any rights, even any domestic partnership from any local level. However, we can see some cooperation, uh, uh, especially multinational cooperation recognize Korean same-sex couple who got their marriage licenses from overseas. Um, Although transgender people can change their legal gender, the court requires them to undergo invasive surgery even though some people do not need a medical transition. So many trans people's legal gender doesn't fit their um, gender identity. This leads to various discrimination and exclusion in education, workplace, or everywhere. Culturally, um, South Korea is known for strong anti-gay opposition from evangelicals. Um, I think you may have seen some interesting photos of evangelical protesting at our pride event. Um, I believe those people got uh, got their influence from uh, Korean American churches sometimes uh, uh, UK, sometimes US. Although they are very well organized and very well well funded and very vocal, we cannot say they are the majority. Uh, 90% of Koreans support the Non-Discrimination Act and 35% of people support same-sex marriage. And the number seems growing every year. Uh, So there is an encouraging trend. So generally we can say the younger generation is supportive of LGBTQ rights. Um, partly due to their exposure to uh, mass media. Still, most of the general public doesn't know any LGBTQ people in their lives. So there's no emotional cue for them to emphasize with these invisible population. So that's the challenge we are facing right now. 
in short, um, Korea has an invisibility problem and the legislative change is very slow, but we can see an encouraging trend. Um, so I'm looking forward to our discussion in the later part of the event. Thank you. Minhee, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, touching on lots of uh, lots of really in interesting that I that uh, point that you made about the invisible population, I think, is, is a very, very powerful one. So um, uh, thanks. So uh, as as I warn the, the panelists, so hopefully you've you've had time to um, uh, compose your thoughts. I, I wanted to start um, for 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 my benefit as well as I, I suspect uh, for the benefit of a number of attendees who who may not be Asian themselves or may not have grown up uh, within an Asian community. Putting to one side the kind of the the laws in your particular countries and your particular regions. Could, could you reflect a little bit about um, what being gay and Asian means within um, within within your within your community and the the kind of being very simplistic about it, but you know the Asian values, recognizing that there is not one set of Asian values. That's a, that's a very heterogeneous thing. But I, I think it might be quite interesting to start with that kind of cultural social aspect before we 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 speak about um, the legal situation. Um, I, I'm going to take it in a slightly different order from how we, we, we started. So midnight, I hope it's not a, a shock that I ask you to, to, to go first on that. Oh, you were no, very interesting in saying Thailand is open provided it's private, but in public it's a different matter. Um, well, I guess uh, the majority of uh, your Thai populations are uh, uh, Buddhist and we don't have the scriptures that really tells you like, you know, um, you know, sex is wrong and this is wrong. It's, um, and if you, know, if you want to be a religious person, you become a monk, you know, you go to temples. Um, so it's quite separate in terms of how it affects your normal life. Uh, so it's not in the same way as, um, you know, for example, if, um, uh, if you want to get married in the eyes of the community, you can just do, you can just do it. Um, you get the monks to come and uh, you know give give their blessings or whatever, but it's not the actual. It's not because of the monks that gives you the kind of like marriage sanctity or or that see that see you as a partner together. It's really the community that sees you as partner. Um, so you know all our all our marriages is actually civil because you go to the district office to sign that contract. Um, but you know so you can have your you can have your um in the news a lot of <laughs> on the news about you know gay guys are being married, but you know, it's just in the eyes of the community under the law, they're not, you know, so they, they, would, they won't have the um, privileges of, um, of the laws protecting them there. So that so that's in the kind of like the, the Thai context. So how does that affect in terms of um, if you're born um, um, into the society and, 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 and how it plays out in, as, as a gay person? It really depends, like um, <laughs> as in any context. I come from Northeast Thailand where it's, um, uh, you know, not as, um, strict in terms of um, the way you express yourself. Um, we have very, uh, you know, lots of festivals, so it's about fun, it's about expressing yourself. So, so people can, very young, can kind of come out, uh, you know, and, and particularly be effeminate. And where there are parties, you know, they'll, you know, they'll be the one who actually goes to do the dancing. And, and so, it, so it's that culture that we, that, that, that we are kind of like I'm used to um, in, in kind of like a fun way. But when, when I kind of contrast that to say Central Thailand, where there's a lot more, can say um, Chinese Thais, they are quite more strict in terms of what they want to project out to others, like you know being from a certain status, um, they don't want to talk about certain things that might be seen as not um, uh, not going to be beneficial for their for their family and their family names, for example. So um, so there is a lot more pressure, I think, if you have um, the uh, kind of like. Uh, Chinese ancestry, uh, particularly for if you're the only, uh, you know, man, if you're only son, um, there's a lot of pressure in, in, in that. So we have um, within APCOM, so a, quite a mixture of um, different people from different backgrounds, and some are like Christian as well, Thais, um, who um, kind of like, um, not, they, they won't tell their family, for example, um, but they can come out within the organization like, like, like that, that we have. So it really depends. Um, but uh, what, what a lot of people do tend to do is like, um, if, well, if, if, well, transgender, you cannot, you cannot hide, they, they, they can come out and whether um, their family accept them or not, they tend to get out of their, um, of, um, of the countryside where they're from anyway, to kind of like pursue other, um, other jobs. And if they can send money home, 
um, then they are seen as you know a good person. So that's what that's how they can sort of like redeem um, status within the society if they can prove that they can support themselves and also their family. Fascinating. Thank, thank you, Midnight. That was yeah, r really, really interesting. Um, Glenn, I wonder if I could come come to you next. You you spoke a bit about how 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 your mom viewed things. So if you um, could you reflect on you know the so social cultural norms of the community. Oh, I thought the question was about you know being gay and Asian and what what does that mean? Um, fine. Go with that one. It's about sex and love. You know, the no, I'm serious. Those of you who are ready to go to a van, y'all have a fun time tonight. So I am, no, and I, I am saying this as a proud Asian person with all the humility and all the prideness of who and everything that I am. Our oppression as queer and trans people is based on how we love, who we love, and what we love with. We don't just seek the ability to fuck in as adult, consenting adults to the privacy of our home. I'm sorry for being crass and honest, uh, but oh, now Peter comes, <laughs> I mean, attends. Um, uh, uh, but it is also the fulfillment of our, emo our minds, our emotion, our, you know, our relationships, right? Our, our organization, no relationships with each other. Two, the fulfillment of our hearts. Who do we love? Who supports me? Who will take care of me in sick and death? Who else will I take care of? Can we share life together? And three, the fulfillment of what we have in our groin. Sex is important. It's wonderful. And as Asians, we are too shy about this stuff. Look, I come out of the AIDS crisis. We did a lot of sex education work and healthy, safe play, how to play with a trans cock, you know, and, and this is a liberation that we seek. The ability to love openly, not necessarily publicly in a public park. Well, maybe for some people, but the ability to love openly and publicly and authentically to express the love that we want. Because even if we get the right to marry and legal protection, and look, I'm a lawyer, but still people get beaten up and shamed for how they love or who they love. We have not done our jobs. And there is many sexual pro exciting pre-lectivities in the Book of Kar Karma Sutra, in ancient Chinese and Korean history of how we have enjoyed each other's bodies. And we should be able to do that. You know, our God says that our bodies are our temple and we should nourish our bodies. In a legal heterosexual construct, sex is a component of a marriage, a required marriage, a required component. So, but Glenn, just to just to press you a little bit on that. So, but specifically as a, as a, as an Asian person, yes, you know, what, what, I think we are too. What you say there are are, are, are universal fearful. things that affect us all. So, specifically as an Asian person, you know. The problem, I love Asians, but the problem with us is that we are just too negative and prudish. Our history, and, and Kano said this, uh, Japanese, Korean, ancient cultures have recognized sex and dynamic sex and same-sex love for a millennia before Western worlds did. What happened to us? And that is the return that I am hoping for, that we claim our traditional identities of dynamic, wonderful, and sexual love in all of its exciting forms, tools, toys, and experiences. Very good, thank, thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, just move on a little bit. All of these questions, I hope, are, are connected, so we can go back to them if you if you feel that you wanted to say something on on that previous one. But um, I'm interested in uh, actually all of the panelists' views as to um, the direction of travel, as it were. Are you feeling more optimistic about moving towards equality and inclusivity, or are you becoming more concerned 
um, about the situation in, in your country and your, your region. Um, Minhi, could I go to you first and say, I, uh, do, uh, are, you, are you seeing improvement or are you concerned that, uh, I, I've, I think it was Kakan who said you take one step forward, but sometimes you end up going two steps back. Um, I'm cautiously op optimistic about our future um, because um, I, I started uh, doing this job um, about 10 years ago and um, in some ways uh, the concrete legislative change hasn't been there yet, but in terms of social awareness um, and representation and exposure especially um, about uh, transgender people in our community or uh, uh, in the general public. Uh, uh, we can see strong uh, awareness from the public. So I'm, I'm uh, in a way optimistic, um, but um, the uh, dif difference um, uh, between 10 year, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, because our opposition, uh, they started to get mobilized around early 2000. Uh, before that, there is no strong, um, well-organized LGBT, uh, anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. So there is uh, no good news. And also there was no bad news, but now uh, young LGBTQ youth from South Korea, they had to go through these all kinds of bad news from mass media, especially from the, uh, anti-gay opposition. Um, so they have, uh, our LGBTQ youth have very um, biased perception of reality. Oh, every, everybody might be hating me. Every Korean might be hating me. Uh, but I, I'm, I tell them actually there are more uh, acceptance and very encouraging trend in, in South Korea and the um, change is very imminent and we should be very hopeful, but uh, at the same time, I mean, there are uh, a lot of backlash during the, uh, especially anti-trans backlash uh, under the uh, Trump administration uh, from the US and certain uh, anti-trans climate uh, from the UK. So any kind of those bad news, uh, when the news came over to South Korea, actually it affects our LGBTQs as well. So um, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I'm uh, certainly uh, worried about certain trend. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, very thoughtful. Um, we'll, let me go to Hong Kong next and Jerome, and then I'll go a bit north up to mainland China and Yang. So J Jerome first. Thank you. I, I, I share basically uh, the future of LGBT equality in Hong Kong, I would say, cautiously uh, optimistic. I've been cautiously optimistic in the sense of uh, about research data that I have been seeing over the years. Uh, for example, a research came out a year ago. It was done by the Chinese University of Hong Kong, a very comprehensive and quantitative research. Uh, in short, basically on the issue of marriage equality, for example, 49% uh, supported, 23% uh, opposed, the rest, neutral. And I asked the researcher, what does that mean, neutrality mean? He gave me a very interesting answer. They, the way he saw, it's, quite, it's actually quite straightforward. Neutrality is not a bad thing. It's, it could simply mean people have no strong feelings against, uh, let's say, marriage equality. At the same time, they are not ready to say yes. So what I'm seeing is a large percentage of people that we can engage and flip them around. And in the same research, they, they ask uh, some other very interesting questions. For example, on anti-discrimination law, roughly two thirds of the respondents supported the, that there should be a law to protect people from discrimination because of sexual orientation. When the question uh, is about uh, companies, uh, corporate sponsorship of, of like prior events, people didn't have a problem. So I think that's good from, from a, empirical evidence point of view. Then I try to compare that from what I have uh, observed over the years. For example, quite in the past, I would say three to four, let's say three years. Increasingly, I have seen more and more couples showing affection to each other on the street. 
I'm talking especially about gay male couples because you have two girls holding hands, no big deal. But if you have two guys holding hands, a totally different story. What I'm seeing is I've seen, I started seeing more and more and more. It's just only not only in certain districts, it's pretty much, I'm not saying all over Hong Kong, but certainly it goes beyond the usual district, like, like let's say the, 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 the CBD or whatnot. And, and I look around, nobody really care. And I think that's a very good sign. I mean, to me, my experience is if I look at what other countries have gone through and the situation we are going through, I think society in general is always ahead of the government. Uh, case in point, uh, just a little bit, of, little, a little bit about myself. I mean, I was born in Hong Kong, but then I, I went to Canada to study, and eventually I, I, I worked there. I lived there, so I, I spent a great deal of time in, in Canada, and I, I lived in one of the a very progressive cities, Vancouver, by the way. And, you know, people think of Canada as such a progressive city, very, very LGBT friendly. True. But at the same time, I remember when it came to marriage equality, uh, you know, back in the early uh, 2000s, the government of the day, it was a liberal government. They were ready to commit to marriage equality. They were still dancing around the issue as much as if we believe in poll numbers, people in big city were overwhelmingly supportive of marriage equality, not so in certain provinces, but if we look at the data in aggregate, then the, the answer is very clear. But even how, even actually how many times repressed uh, certain government officials, they kept dancing around. Only, only a few came out in support of marriage equality. Obviously they had their political considerations, but by sharing this example, what I'm trying to demonstrate is, you know, Politics is politics, government is government. I think society is always ahead. And the thing to do in general to advance marriage equality is to build a strong support on the ground. Because when we have that kind of support, I would say it's far more easier to, to persuade the, the government to do something about it. So uh, cautiously optimistic back in Hong Kong because as I just pointed out the numbers. And secondly, over the years, we have have I think we have gained, I would say, a vast majority of our rights for the courts. And the courts have consistently uh, made very good rulings uh, with respect to anti-discrimination. I know to some people, they are not bold enough. Uh, they are in general, one could argue, they take a rather conservative approach, but that's the legal side of things I'm not gonna go into. But what I'm trying to point out is, if we take a more sort of high level view or in totality, the other would say the courts are, are quite predictable as long as there is a good case, there are sound legal arguments. That I would say, yes, the court would have no hesitation to rule in favor of the LGBT community. And, and I would say in the foreseeable future, that will be the case. And, um, and very interestingly, before I, 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 I sort of conclude my remarks, I mean, in Hong Kong, we're talking about a very compact city of uh, more than 7 million people. Uh, in more, many big cities, of course, they have pride parades, but in Hong Kong, actually, we have a free major uh, LGBT events uh, each year, uh, save for the exception of because of COVID last year. So in addition to, to Pride, we have Pink Dot, and then we have Pink Season. And they're all kind of packed together in the second half of the year. So in a very interesting way, on the ground here, we do have a very active LGBT uh, uh, movement and, and obviously events. And I think in general, uh, uh, the visibility is good. And I would say media reporting has been uh, moving in the right direction. I have seen more editorials in support of LGBT equality. Uh, we have seen high profile people coming out. So those, when we put all those things together, I think the logical conclusion is they point to the right direction. We are sort of at a very interesting crossroad. I would say if we consistently be able to keep more engagement on the ground and, and keep uh, talking to people, then I would say we would be able to gain uh, more rights uh, in the not so distant future. Jerome, thank you. Thank you. Um, again, a really kind of uh, comprehensive overview of, uh, of developments in Hong Kong. If I could move, move up to mainland China, as it were, and Yang, can I get your, your thoughts? Do you see things improving or do you have concerns? Um, it's a very tricky question, so uh, I could, I guess I couldn't give you a explicit pra a prediction to the future, but based on my knowledge, so I think the first, 
in China for the public is getting hard to see LGBT image on media coverage. So because I do media research every year, so I found since 2015, the, 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 total, the total number of media coverage regarding LGBT issues is shrinking. So I think for the public, so as for the uh, majorities, the media is the main way to know what LGBT people is and what's their life like in China. So, but the media coverage, the, the number of media coverage in China is shrinking. So it's become harder for people to know, okay, in China, LGBT people exist in this large country and something like that. So it's very challenging for LGBT people and LGBT communities in China. So second, the, uh, we know that China is an authoritarian country. So, and the government constantly launched um, regulations on media. So recently they launched the new policy that asked social media, social media companies that put more effort on, um, um, overseas, what people are talking about politics, talking about diplomatics, talk about everything. The, the policies haven't um, affected us, but we are afraid that it could be damaged us for the future because in China, the social media platform is the main sources that we keep in touch, that we reached our communities and also educate the public and also do campaigns. So, um, so campaigns, so um, so I feel a little bit worried about that. And the second, I would like to say that even we are facing a lot of the challenges in China, but uh, activists and LGBT organizations in China are very active. So um, for instance, in, China, in, the, uh, in last year, in last year, they are, to, they are 20% made coverage in LGBT made coverage in China are about trans groups. So not just because the, the journalists like they find out they, they'd like to report trans, trans groups, just all because trans groups have launched so many campaigns on social media and also online and offline. So they create a lot of reasons for journalists that join the movement and to increase the representation of trans people in China. So I think even where there's still a lot of challenges, but we still, there's still a more room available for us. And the last thing I want to say is that even now in China, so I think China is very difficult to convince the public that LGBT people are being uh, disadvantaged and mobilized, uh, marginalized, because every time we talk about rights, we talk about legal, it's very difficult to understand. But sometimes when some bad things happen, we obviously like how vulnerable we are. So for last year, because of COVID pandemic, so um, there's no too much, there's no many co major coverage that report what happened inside the LGBT communities and what we faced. But also we heard very, some very heartbreaking stories like some gay couples, one doctors, one, one police officers, a police officer and the doctor was sent to the front line, but because they don't come out. So, so, so when they say goodbye in airports, the only thing they, can, they could do is to wave their heads. When they see a lot of doctors, house, healthcare workers are surrounded by their families, by their loved ones, for gay people, the early thing you can do just wave your hands. So it's very, very sad. So this kind of thing is con constantly remind us what we should do and what we are facing in China. Thank you. Um, really, really insightful. Um, thank you very much. I, the time is always against us on, on these events and we, we um, uh, uh, have, have so many questions. I'm looking at the Q&A at the same time as listening to these fantastic responses and I, I want to make sure we get as many of those. I've got one more question though uh, and I'm going to ask it to Kakan and to Midnight um, and be really mean and ask you to be be as brief as you can with uh, with your responses but it will set us up for some of the questions coming through in, in the Q&A. Um, and, and the question is this, what, what um, 
what can the the West, as it were, I'm thinking specifically, of course, the UK, because that's uh, where where we're hosting this, but the, the West more broadly, what can the West learn from Asian regions about inclusivity? Um, from, from my perspective, from my perspective, I, I, I look at, you know, history again, and the Stonewall riots, you know, going back 50 years ago, and I think that's where we are in terms of South Asian LGBT, we're, you know, we're, we're about 50 years behind in terms of our revolution and our movement so I always say that what we need is a Gaijin revolution not necessarily you know throwing the bricks but looking at a movement whereby we're much more working partnership with people across the UK and possibly again internationally as well so how we can make it better um, because I do find that um, funds are very scarce anyway and organizations it's very much disjointed um, a lot more political activate activity goes on in London um, more so than here in the Midlands and up north. Um, the little groups that are coming through, unfortunately, again, they're voluntarily led groups um, and they tend to disband after a couple of years. So I, I would like to look at resources and funding for either individuals or organisations. Um, and I think the West as well has a lot to play in this because obviously um, what Glenn was saying earlier, that they, we, the, the, the East takes on a lot of the colonialism, um, you know, and, you know, going back 200 years, you know, we were very expressive, but the West took over and um, set that that mindset into our heads, you know, and uh, it's really unfortunate that we can't shake it off. So I would say that we look at, the West will look at either history and in terms of moving forward, that we have more educational tools and resources. Um, in, in the UK, we have No Outsiders, the program to allow people to learn more about different types of families. Um, I'd like that to go across the board, not necessarily here in the UK, but across the world that people adopt that sort of um, toolkit as a resource because it's a very simplistic view of the world, but it works really well for children. It enables to see that, you know, the community is very diverse. There are single families, there are same-sex families and um, families made up of other kind of people. Um, and I know that's happened in Brazil and parts of America. I'm not mm -hmm. too sure if it happens in Japan or China or Thailand, but as a toolkit, I do think that, you know, we have to start young, with young children. We don't necessarily have to tell them about sex, but we do have to tell them about human co connections and how we contact with one another. Um, and also about how we communicate with one another. I think it's really important that we have to educate children and the younger generation coming through that everybody is diverse and everybody is unique. Um, yes. And we also have to learn that there are no statistics whatsoever, as far as I'm aware, for the South Asian um, LGBT in terms of suicide rates, or if there's any successful couples out there, or, you know, like there's the negative stories or the positive stories. So there's no st statistics out there. Um, they don't tend to take part in any polls or surveys or reports. Um, I know that for a fact from the Stonewall report back in 2018, um, it was a very minute uh, data that was provided. I think only less than 1% people from yeah. the South Asian diaspora who um, contributed to that. And even again, that was it took a lot of like knocking on doors and pushing the survey forward to get people to engage a lot more. So we can't just necessarily, I feel, we can't just necessarily blame everything at the West. Um, we also need to look at ourselves as to what we want to do, because otherwise it seems like that we from the South Asian diaspora, especially those who are LGBT, it sometimes looks like we're colluding with our own oppressions um, because we know that we've got support systems in place, but we just need to push it a little bit more so that we do have role models out there. We do have voices and stories that we can listen to. And, you know, we do have more kind of uh, events like this, which are not necessarily just on Zoom, but on the mainstream as well. Um, so, you know, we, it's a learning curve for both sides, the East and the West, you know, yeah. and um, I'm really grateful, like my father going back a number of years, um, he put it forward that LGBT community can adopt and foster. And um, you're looking back at the 90s then, and I said, it's impossible, but here we are now, we can do that in the UK. So. I'm cautiously optimistic, but at the same time, I'm, I'm very proud that in the UK, we can push forward for change. Thank, 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 thanks very much. You, you actually answered in passing one of the questions in the Q&A, which is, uh, are, you know, what statistics are available about the South Asian community, particularly in the UK? And uh, the, the answer is that the rel relatively little is known because uh, the, um, um, uh, the the data just aren't aren't captured. Um, I'm also in my my role. I, I like to remind people because sometimes there is an assumption that 
you know, the UK is very progressive. Um, and I, I like to remind people quite often that actually it was only last year that same sex marriage became legal in all parts of the UK in 2020. Um, so I think the UK has a lot to learn from other uh, 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 other countries, and I'm always keen. That's why I'm asking the question. And I wonder, Midnight, could uh, just just briefly, could I get your thoughts as to what the UK and the West might be able to learn from uh, other Asian countries? Um, I agree with Kakan in terms of ensuring that there's spaces like this where it's actually Asian talking about uh, about our experiences. It doesn't happen across the um, across the countries um, naturally. Um, I think even with diasporas, we tend to kind of stay within their own groups and the ability to kind of like you know talk outside of your own groups and then share experiences. You know, coming out or you know accessing some certain um, you know, services. Uh, you know, these are things that you know you don't normally connect um, uh, and talk to each other about. And, um, and the importance of um, having kind of role models and having uh, people talking um, about issues like this. So I think particularly in countries where it's really hard um, and it's dangerous to come out and to really champion for LGBTI rights and to be who they are. And one of the things at APCOM that we do is the um, Hero Awards that we give awards to activists in the region, in the Asia Pacific, around uh, these particular issues because they need the space to be able to be recognized um, as, you know, um, kind of like activists. And also others can see themselves, you know, in our region that, wow, you know, this person did that and no, I can do that. Could I, you know, and, and, and it's something that inspiring and, and we don't have the spotlights on that because we look certain ways, we're not, you know, <laughs> uh, you know famous enough or things like that. And, and I think that is a, that's the issue around not being enough of something, you know, but I think, for diasporas, then, then that is even more so. Um, you know, you're very different. I remember when I was growing up, I, I feel so different. I, I want to blend in, I don't want to stand out because I, I don't want to kind of be targeted. And I think th those are like anxieties that we have all the time and we don't have a lot of spaces to be able to talk about those. Um, what the West can learn, um, I think it's, um, it's, yeah, provide these kind of spaces and, and, and more of these spaces where the Asian communities can also curate and then get bringing new different voices. So yeah. I, and, and I think let's let's have more of these discussions. Thank you, Midnight. Um, so uh, that sort of that's the first half of the, the the panel discussion. We've got lots and lots of Q and A's, uh, and um, uh, not enough time to do them justice. But uh, we, we'll we'll be doing that. But first, I wanted to invite Glenn, uh, trusting on the technology now and Glenn's ability to share screen. Uh, because Glenn's got a, a video that he'd like to share with us. So, Glenn, over to you. I mean, very good. Um, so, you know, sometimes the best people can tell our stories are, are, and show their love are non-Asians themselves. I'm sorry, non-LGBTQ Asians. Um, and bring visibility and love to the fore is what our community is about. And for us, it is our parents and our families. And that is what is unique for Asians. In the chat, I posted a series of leaflets in 27 Asian and Pacific Islanders languages. You know, and I have all the scripts, I have all the dialects that just begins the conversation from a third party about queer identity, about religion, about education, we can be gay and lesbian and doctors and lawyers, and we can be gay and lesbian and be sex workers and community organizers. We can be rich and some of us are poor. And the materials are culturally competent. Please use them, download them. And if you're not out and you're, you're a young person, print it out, put it on the living room table, run upstairs, wait till mom and dad get home and then come downstairs after they see it in Indonesian or Basaha and say, I have something to tell you. And then you can play this video. This one is in Mandarin with English subtitles, but I have it in Korean, Japanese, uh, Cantonese, Hindi, Urdu, well, a little bit of Sikh. Uh, well, I mean Punjabi, so here we go. <laughs> 歧视、孤立和排挤
爱及接受你的孩子，不管他是同性恋、双性恋、跨性别恋者，无论如何，家人毕竟是家人，爱依然是爱。I do this because I love my son. 哦，感谢所有的鼓励。那是工作我们做的，为了带我们的故事到更多的观众。所以，很多次，我们的父母爱我们，但没人知道。我们不是黑人家庭的一部分。我们可以是一个骄傲的孩子，有一个孩子。但我们也可以是最后一个，被我的儿子当成我的爸爸。所以，有一个排序在我的家庭。但我的孩子。Child, though number five, is still a grandchild of my parents, and so I'll post、uh, online where you could download some of these videos, share them, use them, and make your own. Thank you. Terrific, Glenn. Thank, thank you, and thank you ever so much for、uh, for for sharing it. I know that I, I know that's touched touched a number of us on the panel, and also those those who are, are listening. So.、Um, Uh, we we've got seventeen minutes, sixteen and a half, because I'll need thirty seconds to thank everybody for coming.、Um, uh, so let let me do my best to、um, go through some fantastic questions in the Q and A. So thank you to everyone. I I, I apologise in advance if I don't manage to、uh, to, to raise your question,、uh, but let me start. One question that really struck me: Are the same ideas around sex and sexuality the same for Asian women?、Um, and、um, uh, Minhee, would you mind if I go to you for first on that?、Um, uh, specifically, the question about you know are, are the are the issues different for Asian women versus Asian men? So. I don't know if this is Asian thing or not, but I think it depends on the degree to which misogyny works in Asia or in any Asian countries.、Um, so, in South Korea,、uh, where women's sexuality is excessively sexualized or repressed, <laughs>、um, lesbian desire can be、uh, very repressed and invisible. Um, so when I talk to、um, uh, general public about、um, uh, their perception of LGBTQ people,、uh, they reacted really badly、um, against、uh, gay sexuality because、uh, for them,、uh, gay sexuality is very、um, overly represented、uh, in any kind of mass media. But They reacted very neutral on、uh, lesbian <laughs> lesbianism because、uh, they have any they don't have any idea on, on、um, lesbians' desire. So I don't know if this is a good thing or not. But、um, invisibility cannot be a good thing. So、um, yeah, so that's the situation. Thank you, Minhee.、Uh, let Let me open that up to any of the. Any of the other panelists who'd want to 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 come in, Jerome, I see you unmuted yourself. So, would you like to?、Um, just want to pitch it a little bit because this situation is really peculiar to Hong Kong. I mean, yes, we decriminalize homosexuality as I, earlier I mentioned, thirty odd years ago. But I just want to make it clear, the laws at that time were targeting gay males specifically. So, for throughout the history of basically Hong Kong, lesbianism. Was okay and still obviously is still okay. The laws of the book that brought, that were brought in by the British they targeted specifically gay males. So、uh, I guess from that perspective, one could argue, you know, when it comes to LGBT activism, it has always been perceived as very gay male focused. First of all, obviously dealing with decriminalization, and secondly, when then we obviously the community as a whole had to deal with、uh, the AIDS crisis, and again. That obviously has a very strong linkage to the gay male population, but this is not to dismiss some of the challenges、uh, facing by、uh, our lesbian friends here here in Hong Kong. Simply because when it comes to many things, they have different approaches, and and 
and in as I guess relatively speaking, now I, obviously I don't want to trivialize or dismiss uh, the, the challenges facing our uh, lesbian friends here, but I would argue that in general, very generally speaking, I mean, people tend to have a slightly higher level of tolerance for lesbian versus gay men. So from that regard, I would say there could be some fine challenges or different approaches. But I think what we are seeing these days, as especially, especially in the past 10 years, I think we are seeing a, a bit of a convergence in the sense of within the big LGBT family, we are seeing the need to work closely together. Yes, we are dealing with both the issues of sexual orientation and gender identity. But nevertheless, we are talking about uh, sexual and gender, uh, sexual minorities. So I think there is a general recognition that yes, people in the community need to work a bit closer together and, and make the noise uh, uh, heard. And, and, and I think in that regard, I think it, it, it's a good thing because obviously, you know, it, it, it's a bit, I would say, dangerous to have a movement, uh, I would say, dominated by, by gay males only. Thanks, Jerome. Yang, I'm going to bring you in just in, in a moment. I, I did just want to point out that, of course, we're, we're speaking um, just for, for this particular question in a, in a very binary way. And of, uh, of course, it's it's far more complex than that. And individual identities uh, aren't, aren't just uh, uh, ma male, female, w women, man. But just for, I, I just thought it was useful to frame it just to sort of tease out some, some of the issues. Uh, Yang. Okay, so I think, and so in China, the lesbian is always underrepresented. So based on my research last year, uh, the early 6% media coverage that folks on lesbian in China. So, and also for many media companies and journalists. So sometimes we are, when they report lesbian uh, groups, they made the decision that they pick specific things between their, uh, their gender and their, uh, or in the uh, sexual orientation. So I can give you an example. Say so in 2018, uh, lesbian committed suicide in a very popular tourist attractions. So first she is uh, reported to lot to lost and then people find that he's committed suicide. So many, so soon it's the news become a national break news, but when, when we do the research, we did the research to find many journalists and many coverage, they try, they pick the title like young college girl committed suicide in uh, tourist attractions or a uh, young college or young lady missed in somewhere. But there are only two media companies that highlight his, that she is a lesbian. So sometimes I think in China, it's, it's, for mass media, sometimes they more likely to stress the, the women's gender rather than sexual orientations. So in practically, so sometimes they feel like it's very unfair. Thank you, Yang. Very, um, again, re really insightful, very, very helpful. Let me, let me um, obviously other panelists, if you want to return to that question, please feel free, but I, I'm gonna try and move on because there are lots of other questions. Um, we've already noted that, um, you know, we're speaking about being queer Asian, uh, but Asian is not itself, um, um, uh, you know, a, a single concept. It's a very heterogeneous thing. Um, quite a few people, uh, and I'm combining a few questions now, quite a few people have noted that Taiwan is exceptional as the only place in, in Asia uh, that's legalized uh, marriage equality. And uh, at least one person has also, also drawn the comparison with Japan where it's perhaps slower to recognize um, uh, same-sex marriage uh, uh, and, and so on. So um, your thoughts panelists on why Taiwan, uh, Taiwan and Japan are so different? Who feels brave enough to go with that one? Glenn. Uh, Glenn, you, you were unmuted and now you are muted. I will go. And... No, I'm kidding. Um, I, you know, just, I am not Nikkei, I am not Japanese, but I've been working with uh, some of the local activists in Japan and I know that they're here. Uh, how are you? Uh, konnichiwa. Uh, anyway, so, 
one of the things that's happening in Japan, and again, you know, if, for my colleagues who are Japanese that are, feel free to chime in, is that the campaign actually for same-sex marriage has been pushed at a very high professional level, corporations, government officials, privileged activists, and that's fine. But in the provinces, they're still trying to get basic resources about queerness, right? Japan is not Tokyo. It is, it, we did a tour in Sapporo, Nagoya, uh, Tokyo. Uh, if I had the time, I would post a picture of me speaking to a thousand kids uh, in uh, Nagoya about queerness. One of the lessons that we've been trying to, one of the things that we've been trying to explain to the activists in Japan is that in America, when we once, and they're trying to replicate what we did in America in Japan. But in America, when we won the right for marriage and our Supreme Court did that, public opinion was showing that 56%, a majority of Americans supported same-sex marriage. The law followed the public. You think it's the other way around, but I'm a lawyer, oftentimes it's really not. And in Japan, you know, like many of our communities, it's a very conformist and traditional society. It has survived for a millennia and has excelled and has come back after so much difficulty in their own social structure. So there are powerful forces that do not want to disrupt those structures. And the challenge in Japan is not to win this at a far off Supreme Judicial Court, but to win this in the rice paddies of you know, the Southern part of Japan to build that local understanding and humanize us. And we've been trying to, and they've been trying to work on this to bring queer identity, again, not to Tokyo, Nagoya or Sapporo or Hokkaido, but to the villages and towns that really don't know that much. You can go to a bar, a gay bar in Tokyo, but most of the gays are not in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. And so that is what is happening there. Uh, thank you. Glenn, thanks. Yang, is, is that what, what I think is known as a legacy hand, or is that on, on this specific Taiwan-Japan comparison? Uh, I think it's about, um, so initially when Taiwan passed the same-sex marriage, it's very encouraging for people in China. And also, um, they give me, they give, LGBT people in China more imaginations like what we could do in the future because we share the same background. But also at the meantime, we find like in China it's very difficult. So so LGBT people are also for the public. It's get hard to get to the, the information like what LGBT movements and what LGBT people's life in Taiwan and also in Hong Kong and also in another areas. So I've it's very difficult to answer the question, but we do find like, so first is a big, uh, it's, it's a bold of people's imagination like, but also I think um, because people's ability to access the information is quite limited now in China. Thank you. Uh, and actually some, uh, that that's r- really helpful that uh, somebody's posted something very helpful in the q and I'm not sure everybody can see that. So I might ask, uh, Sammy uh, or, or Pete just to copy that, um, referring to some work by uh, Claire Marie from the University of Melbourne um, uh, 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 about this question. So thank you to um, whoever, whoever posted that, that's re- really interesting. Okay, uh, time is really against us and um, I, I'm going to be brave and try and get in um, three more questions. I don't think I'm going to manage that, but uh, we'll, we'll see how we get on. Um, do, do we face a problem that we've got a very white and Western definition of queer liberation? Uh, I wonder, Midnight, do you mind if I go to you on that? Sorry, what's the question? Um, I... I, I... <laughs> I think it is. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No, no. I think, I, I think, I think the discourse, the discourse, has been very much, you know, in terms of these discussions. Um, 
and, and that's the kind of language that we're currently using. And I think that's problematic when we are talking in terms of like, you know, like in Asia, for example, it's really, <laughs> it's massive, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, East Asia, and then you include the Pacific in as well. And I think it's just so hard to kind of like lump them all, all of them in. Um, and, you know, I work a lot with UN and, and that those kind of language is so contested. In, mm. at, at international level as well. So either, you know, we as activists, we can look at um, how do we fight that at the international level in terms of including those languages through SCAP, for example, and which we're never gonna, <laughs> we were never gonna go through or be practical in terms of how, how is it being done on the ground. So like here, you know, we are, we are using the term queer because we are using kind of global discussions, but then in my communities it will be very different in terms of, you know, we were talking about Katoi, uh, we were talking about Tom D or gay, uh, but, but these are different identities. But actually when the younger people who are on social media, they don't want to be any of these acronyms at all, you know, and it's, and it's, it's mm -hmm. constantly changing the way that um, people, younger people, older people, how, how we identify ourselves. Uh, what I think, um, what I think is the danger is that if we don't have the kind of language that then put us together in terms of experiences about, um, you know, non-inclusion uh, and, and not having the kind of local terms to have that space where everyone can have these discussions, it will become, um, I think, like a generation, generational thing, and there won't be anything that binds us together, and that's at country level. And then at regional, like the across country, how does that bind us? So I think these are these are the things that um, that, that I feel like we can come up with some different like, language that doesn't always kind of look to 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 the west, um, but also we don't have the kind of spaces kind of like talk about these kind of like um, the different language that con that connects us. Great, Th thank you for doing so well with a with a. Uh, um... A, a, a very tricky, a very tricky, very, very broad question, but I think you responded brilliantly with that. Um, so the, the, the last question, because we do need to finish very shortly, and I'm going to ask for the impossible, which is a single sentence response from each from each of you, if you can. Might be a very long sentence, but a single sentence. Um, how, what can we do to combine our collective efforts uh, to make uh, a change globally as well as in, uh, in each of our country how do we combine forces to uh, uh to, to make a change and i'm going to come to kakan first for your single sentence response quite difficult but um i'm going to think of the three r's and that is remembrance role model and representation um i'd like people to remember our heritage our history that pre-colonial days that we were very expressive um, in ourselves and amongst our communities, we need role models um, to be positive as well as negative. We, we, and we need more representation in media, events, workshops and conferences. Um, and I think we just all we have to do is keep pushing forward for change. Um, I know it's going to take a long time, but, you know, I, I believe that we can do it collectively, as well as within our local communities and regions as well. Very good. I think that qualified as a single sentence, although with a few few commas and semicolons, but that, that, that's great. Thanks, Gokhan. Minhee, can I come to can I come to you next? Uh, sure. Um, uh, since there's no one blueprint for um, equality and liberation, uh, I think it, it will be very crucial for us to share a diverse narrative of our stories. Uh, any kind of success story progress uh, will help us in this region uh, because uh, we are saying that we can make this uh, uh, all together um, and history is for us not against us sorry that's not a one sentence thanks uh, that's, but it's still very good um, i'm glad we gave you more than one sentence because it was worth worth it thank you Minhi. glenn i put in the chat ilga Check them out, the International Gay and Lesbian Alliance Intersex in Asia. Very good. That, that, was, a, that was a single sentence. That's, that's impressive. Thanks. That thanks. was a clause, not even a <laughs> sentence. It was a noun. <laughs> uh, and thanks for the link. That's great. Um, Midnight, if I can come to you next. Um. I think it's just the solidarity, the support that um, yeah needed. Everyone kind of like have to ensure that there is still visibility and voice 
uh, from the communities or from the ground up. Excellent, thank you. Yang. Um, it's very difficult to just say one sentence. So, but I would like to say because it's very close to Lunar Chinese New Year, so I only want wish everybody can have a good and safe holidays. So that's what, what I want to see here. <laughs> and, um, but also I think if everybody wants to know more activist movements in China, please directly uh, get in touch with me. I will send my emails in the talk boxes. Thank you so much. And also thank you for having me. Uh, no, th th thank you, Yang. And uh, Jerome. It's very simple, global perspective, a local narrative. So basically it's in order to advance LGBT equality in your own community, there has to be a local narrative that resonates and connects with people on the ground. Very good. Uh, well, look, you, you, you all rose amazingly to, to uh, a very unfair challenge of responding to that question in, in just one sentence. But um, it just remains for me to say a huge thanks to all of our panelists. It's it's very late in some places and very early in others, but we're so glad that you took took the time to to join us. I, I like to think that this sort of event actually does help to do what we've just spoken about, which is uh, combine forces uh, and hopefully uh, move things in all of our countries and regions in in the right direction. A big thank to everybody who's uh, attended for all of your questions. I'm sorry that we didn't cover. Uh, even the majority of them, but really grateful for for them. And please do uh, look at the rest of our LGBT History Month program. Come to as many events as you possibly can, uh, and please keep the conversation going. Um, hopefully, you've got uh, all, all of the the, the contact links. Uh, we we look forward to continuing the discussion. But once again, to everyone, thank you so much, uh, and happy Lunar New Year. Thanks, everybody.